Can you let me know if you can hear in the back? Oh, great, wonderful. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gina Coos. I'm the director of the College of Education Research Institute. And on behalf of the Institute and our entire Office of Research and Innovation, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Spark, Spark Talks event. That was a tongue twister. On behalf of um, all of us, we really thank you, and we thank Dr. Toby Jenkins um, Henry for allowing us the use of this wonderful space, and we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And um, we thank the Dean for providing support for us today. Over the next hour, we will hear from our colleagues as they briefly share their research scholarship. And in this format, there's no Q&A. However, we have a reception immediately following to provide opportunity to have further conversations with the researchers or with each other, hence sparking research discussions. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Uh, Yang Wang and Dr. Ismahan Arslan Ari. script so we won't talk over time. <laughs> so again, my name is Yang Wang from the Department of ITE. My research interest is in uh, reading comprehension and assessment, English language learning and biliteracy. I am Ismian Arslan Ari, an assistant professor in the Educational Studies program. My research mainly focuses on multimedia learning, human computer interaction and online learning. Today we are going to present our collaborative study titled as Exploring College English as a Second Language Learner's Reading for Academic Purposes Using Eilmanot Miski Analysis. So our research origins from our learning and teaching experiences, from who we are, and there is a large number of international students in higher education in the United States Many students who speak English as an additional language struggle with reading and learning in their disciplines. So in this pilot study, we wanted to investigate how does an international graduate student read illustrated academic text. And the first uh, definition we wanted to introduce is miscue. So miscue is any variation that a reader makes from the text. Some people call them mistakes. We call them miscues because not all <coughs> miscues are mistakes, and they provide a window to the reading process. Eye movement provides us information about what people are looking at at the screen, and we use eye tracker to record the eye movement. And eye movement and miscue analysis is the combination of using recording the eye movements and the miscue analysis to explore the reading process. Retrospective eye movement and miscue analysis involves the reader into the conversation to discuss the reader's eye movement patterns. Our participant, Mei Ling, is from China. She's a new graduate student from the Department of Education uh, ITE. She thinks that she needs to improve her English proficiency by reading more academic materials. Once she achieves the proficiency, she can read for pleasure. We selected two pieces of text. The first text is from um, a book chapter, and the second text, it is on the right, is from a dissertation. Both texts included in text citation and figures. Uh, both are about 630 words long, and the mean sentence length is approximately 20 words. Uh, both are the, at the college reading level. Toby Pro X3 120 screen based eye tracker was used to capture the reader's eye movements. Uh, first, the reader's eye movements were calibrated with nine fixation points. The reader was asked to, asked to follow the red ball we called calibration dots on the screen. Then we recorded the eye movements while the reader was reading the text. We have the eye tracker in our recent establishing computer interaction. And if you like, if you want to learn more and explore more, you are more than welcome to our lab. It is at room 134. And we had two sessions with Mei Ling. We started with asking if she had any prior knowledge about the text. Then she read aloud the text. I marked the miscues and Ismihan monitored the eye tracker. 
After reading, Meiling retold what she just read and answered some comprehension questions. In Reva interview, we played her eye movement video recording, paused at the miscue places, and asked the questions, does the miscue make sense? Why do you think you made this miscue? Describe your eye movements here. How did you use the figure to understand the text? The conversations were recorded and transcribed for analysis. Based on miscue analysis, Mei Ling made three miscues per hundred words and understood about 60% of the text. She had strong grammatical relations and a little loss for the meaning construction. Her miscues looked and sounded highly similar to the text. This shows that she focused more on surface accuracy than meaning making. And this case plots show the eye movements of the reader, and the circles shows the fixation. The, the numbers inside the circles shows the sequence of the eye movement, and the, the size of the size of the uh, dots represents the fixation duration. And as shown here, the reader did not fixate on every every word, although she read a lot all of them. When you follow the sequence of the eye movements, her eyes move from left to right, then she went back and looked at the middle of the sentence. In this example, she realized her miscue and went back to the middle of the sentence to correct her miscue. In this example, Mei replaced the culture with the culture and corrected her miscue. The gaze plot shows the regression of her eye movement. Her eyes moved back during the correction and moved up. Her eyes moved back again at the end of the sentence. Mei Ling said that she wanted to ensure she understood. Actually, on that screen, okay, there it is. <laughs> we want to show you the video clip of this example just when Yang mentioned. The person again is experiencing cultural sh uh, culture shock because of being confronted with a new and unfamiliar view of a view of his or her talk. So after watching the video clip, Mei Ling explained that cultural shock also makes sense. I think it's a grammar practice. When I was in China, I focused more on grammar. So apparently her instructional experience influenced her reading. In both academic texts, the participant focus more on the text than the on image. Uh, although we observe a similar pattern in both texts, she focused on the image more in the second text. We also look at the integrated transitions. It reflects the learner's attempt to integrate the text and the figure. Uh, reader, readers, uh, we calculate the total number of times the eye fixation is moved from text to image and from image to text to calculate the integrated transitions. The reader made more integrated transitions in text two. Uh, the reason might be the figure in the second text is more complex. Also, the reader had some prior knowledge about text one, and in the text two, she said she had difficult time to understand the content, and she wants to, to make some connections between the figure and text to understand more. And this is also reflected in our comprehension scores. Although she had some prior knowledge about text one, her comprehension score was higher on text two. And this case plus represents her eye movements in the first text. Lines shows the integrated transitions. As you see, she did not make too many transitions between the text and the image. However, However, in the te second text, she made frequent transitions between the text and figure. And this is the heat map. It shows how looking is distributed during the reading. As you can see, she did not look at the image a lot. So both miscue analysis and eye movement recorded that she did not read or look at the word resolution. She did not mention it in her retelling either. She explained, I couldn't get the final phase because I haven't read this. So this omission affected her comprehension. Then when we talked about her eye movement, um, she first reported, even though the eye movement was dynamic, she said, oh, my eye movement basically follows the text sequence. It's stable. 
And at the end of the first session, she reported her eye movement was not organized. At the end of the second session, she said, the eye movement is messier, jump here and there. So it took time to realize and believe in what she saw and shift her beliefs in reading. The reading is not a linear process. When the text became more challenging to understand, the reader used the multiple ways to construct a meaning. And our next step is a mixed, a mixed method study working with a larger number of international students from different disciplines. We have already submitted an external grant proposal. We want to thank Dean Peterson for his support to create the Human Computer Interaction Lab. And also, I appreciate Eric's mentorship and encouragement. I feel very grateful to be part of their supportive department. And we wanted to thank the Office of Research and Innovation for this opportunity to share our work. We appreciate our matchmaker, Gina Kunz, who connected us together last <laughs> April. So we get uh, sometimes a blind date, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> and uh, I'm grateful to have the support from my department chair, um, Dr. Finis Boyd, and also the accountability from um, Eric, if you know what we mean. Like, we have someone checking on you hundreds of times that you better keep the ball rolling. <laughs> <laughs> so last and not least, I want to thank my partner Yismiha. She's so wonderful to work with, and I learned a lot from her. She's great answering questions and also bouncing off ideas. And I think we too, we made a great team. And we wanted to announce uh, we are actually the 14th IMA research team in the world. And we are going to hold the annual IMA research conference this coming July on the 11th. So if you're interested, uh, please let us know. Thank you. to share with you an inquiry project on which we've been working a little over a year. As our title indicates, we're interested in better understanding the possibilities for bringing the fields of program evaluation and critical race theory, or CRT, into conversation. Discussions about the intersections of evaluation and race are on the rise, as evidenced by special sections of evaluation journals on race, and numerous presentations on the topic at AEA. In addition, more programs, such as the Build Polar program at Cal State Northridge, are beginning to use CRT as a framework for comprehensive program development. Consequently, it is time to start discussing what kinds of evaluation approaches might be required to successfully evaluate such programs. While addressing positionality is more commonly associated with qualitative research than program evaluation, Understanding the important similarities in our backgrounds goes a long way towards understanding how and why we come to this work. Despite their different titles, both of our doctorates are in Social Foundations of Education, which included coursework in critical race theory. Moreover, during our studies, we were both trained as program evaluators, though our concentration areas were different. In our current roles, Ashley comes to this project as an evaluator first and a researcher second, while I come as a researcher first and an evaluator second. So to really understand what we're describing here, we first need a common understanding of what we mean when we say evaluation and cultural response of evaluation. Evaluators often use the same methods as researchers, but they use them to answer different kinds of questions. Evaluation then seeks to determine an evaluation object or a program's value, worth, or merit. And culturally responsive evaluation, which we're going to refer to as CRE, adds an important lens to evaluation practice by centering the evaluation in culture. So here we see a representation visually of the steps of CRE that have been outlined by Hood, Hobson, and Kirkhart. The visual really demonstrates the ways in which CRE essentially adheres to the typical steps of an evaluation while emphasizing the fact that culture is central to the entire process. Critical race theory in education originated in the field of legal studies, and for the past 20 years, it has increasingly informed the way scholars who study race in educational settings have framed their work. In seeking a comprehensive definition, we turn to noted CRT scholar Solorzano and Yasso, who positions CRT as both a theoretical framework and a methodological approach for addressing the structural and cultural aspects of education that result in the maintenance of racial inequities. Motivated by its commitment to improving the lives of students of color, critical race theory then 
offers a theoretically grounded approach to conducting research in education. CRT, as both theory and methodology, is characterized by five key tenets, the first of which speaks to the permanence and persistence of race and racism and their interconnectedness with other forms of oppression. Other tenets include its a commitment to use research to counter dominant ideologies such as colorblindness or meritocracy, its insistence on centering the lived experience of people of color and framing their experience as legitimate sources of knowledge, the expectation that CRT scholars adopt transdisciplinary perspectives to illuminate their explanatory power. And finally, that CRT is specifically taken up for social justice aims. So our work that we're gonna talk about today is centered around three guiding questions. How might adopting a critical race methodological lens influence the conduct of a culturally responsive evaluation? Of the culturally responsive evaluation phases, which are most likely to be meaningfully altered by adopting a critical race methodological lens? And then what might a CRM informed CRE look like in practice? So to tackle these questions, we developed a process to guide our inquiry. The phases are captured in this visual. First, we reviewed literature to see what was out there already linking these two frameworks, and we found we were really charting some new territory with this work. So we created a matrix of key components to help us visualize the intersections between the two frameworks. Then we chose the culturally responsive evaluation steps most altered so that we could illustrate the impact. Um, we presented this work to an evaluation audience at AEA where it was very well received and we have sought some expert feedback. Responding to our first question, how might adopting a critical race methodological lens influence the conduct of a culturally responsive evaluation require the development of the matrix found on the front and back of your handout's first page. As you can see, we place the nine culturally responsive evaluation stages, along with recommended actions for each stage, in the first column of the matrix. Across the top row, we placed four key tenets of critical race methodology. We assume that the fifth tenet, commitment to social justice, is embedded in the first four. The 36 cells created by the intersection of the stages and the tenets warranted 36 discussions during which we sought to determine the extent to which engaging in that stage with a CRM lens would alter your engagements as an evaluator. An alteration might involve anything from changing the stakeholders involved in that stage to creating entirely new evaluation questions. To communicate our understanding, as well as to provide an answer to our second guiding question, each of the 36 cells was designated by a unique marker. The markers are an indication of our belief that the evaluation step may be significantly altered, the thumbs up, meaning it would change something important about what you did during that stage, or it might be enhanced, the check mark, meaning it might not necessarily change what you did, but it could likely redirect your focus or it was unlikely to be altered or enhanced, the dash, meaning that you would likely engage in the stage as you would carrying out a regular culturally responsive evaluation. So the stages that we determined um, were likely, most likely to be meaningfully altered by a critical race methodological approach were stage four, framing the right questions, and stage eight, analyzing the data, as indicated by the four thumbs up across the entire row in both of those stages. So let's dig a little deeper into why framing the right questions is an evaluation stage that is significantly altered by applying the critical race lens. Perhaps most important is that it's the CRE stage that has the strongest implications for the entirety of the evaluation, as evaluation questions determine the direction for everything to follow. Framing the right evaluation questions from a CRM lens would require evaluators to engage in race conscious thinking at every stage of the evaluation. In order to further illustrate the power of adopting a CRM while conducting a CRE, the last page of the handout reflects our efforts to use four key tenets of critical race theory as a framework for thinking more intentionally about how the original culturally responsive evaluation guidance for framing the right question would shift to reflect notions, concepts, and concerns related to critical race theory. We believe the questions lightly highlighted in the chart offer some of the more significant adaptations. In essence, in a culturally responsive evaluation, the emphasis in this stage on ensuring that stakeholders' voices, perspectives, concerns, and questions are included shifts to a more critical race-conscious orientation that seeks to illuminate power-related issues, unintended racial or cultural bias, 
whiteness in the white racial frame, and the ways in which the program or even the evaluation itself may further marginalize the individuals the program was created to support. Having generated preliminary responses to the guiding questions one and two, obtaining feedback from others, and inviting our expert reviewer, Dr. Rodney Hobson, to write with us, the final step in our process is to craft a real-world evaluation example to illuminate what this might look like in practice throughout all stages of the evaluation. Given that there is nothing yet called critical race evaluation, we'll have to draw upon our collective experiences as evaluators and possibly create a composite evaluation narrative upon which evaluation practitioners can draw to spur deeper consideration about the implications of CRT for their own work. We believe that applying this approach holds great promise given that it aligns with the values that have been set forth by the American Evaluation Association. Notably, it would ensure a consistent focus on the impact of race, racism, and bias on program stakeholders. In addition, by drawing on CRT themes and soliciting counter narratives, the approach allows evaluators and evaluations to speak to and against power structures. However, when it comes to applying a CRM lens in practice, there are significant challenges and risks. Incorporating CRT makes demands of both evaluators and stakeholders that may be unwelcome. All evaluators may not be up to the task as it requires command of sometimes complex racial discourses and critical theories. And while we believe that this approach holds promise for all evaluations, it may be of most use and most welcome when evaluating race or culture-informed educational programs or programs otherwise situated in critical spaces. Thank you very much for your time. Well, it's my privilege to be here to share among my colleagues, and uh, what I'll be talking about comes from uh, my latest book, and, um, and perhaps I'll step on some toes, I don't know, but that's the point of these kinds of conversations. And since teacher education looked to become a formal field of study in the 1800s, it has undergone a rocky history that has endured a continuous wave of criticism with the ever-present hovering of those delegitimizing its relevance. Yet something is happening in teacher education uh, that is unprecedented. That is, while the history of teacher education criticism is not a new phenomenon, it is, however, entering a space in which not only the formal study of education is being undermined, but also the very fabric of the public square is in process of being weakened. To state differently, a neoliberal agenda has been hard at work, which is an agenda that looks to advance privatization, individualism, competition over collaboration, and the dismantling of public spaces with no interest in the common good. And within that mix, teacher education is caught in the larger conversation, a conversation that simultaneously leans toward minimizing critical thought and is fixated on expediency, mindless methodological indoctrination, and training as opposed to education. As current U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos proclaimed in, in 2017 in her first school visit, this is what she said, quote, teachers are waiting to be told what they have to do, end of quote. Teachers are waiting to be told what they have to do. Her patronizing remarks of teachers are palpable, not to mention her disturbing viewpoint on public education. Likewise, in 2002, in a report by then Secretary of Education Rodney Page, in which he, on one hand, was pushing for highly qualified teachers under the No Child Left Behind Act, yet, on the other hand, was quick to castigate traditional teacher education programs and question their significance, all the while touting fast-track uh, programs toward certification. Indeed, the advent of well-funded fast-track training programs, such as Teach for America and other related corporatized agencies, operate under the faulty premise, largely, that traditional university teacher education programs are not doing a good job. 
where Page and his associates worked hard over a decade ago to undermine traditional teacher education, the National Council on Teacher Quality, NCTQ, has picked up the mantle with aiding and abetting the legitimacy of fast-track teacher training agencies. That is, NCTQ clearly possesses a fundamental disdain for traditional teacher education programs, taking every opportunity to rate them low through their partnership with the U.S. News and World Report Annual Edition that misleadingly reports the rankings of schools of education from around the country. In addition to the assault on teacher education from these outside forces, many teacher education programs across the country are working to undercut themselves within by being co-opted by such programs as, as the National Institute for Excellence in Teaching, NIET, a Lowell Milken education corporate enterprise, and we must not forget, an individual who has contributed to the 1990s junk bond scandal. Emphasizing a prescriptive training model through its System for Teacher and Student Advancement TAP and Best Practices Center template, NIET cleverly sucks in many colleges of education as the host to further their privatized agenda. Now, this translates into teacher educators being forced to undergo training in order to conform, and make no mistake about this, which not ironically undermines the value of tenure, dismisses the notion of academic freedom, and ultimately works to defund traditional uh, teacher education programs. In addition to NIET, it is no coincidence that other similar types of corporatized programs have emerged over the past several years, like the Relay Graduate School, Teacher Preparation Analytics, TPA, TPI US, and others. To get to this place where we are today has been a decades-long unfolding process, one that has its aim to ultimately eradicate teacher education programs, and that's a very bad thing. Yet, in our work, in our book, we are not suggesting that traditional teacher education <coughs> programs have no room for improvement or should be resistant to change. In fact, teacher education has a long history of its own internal struggles. For example, the status, funding sources, and expectations for Research One or flagship universities are quite different from regional university settings, all of which interconnects hiring practices and the political landmine relative to concepts intersecting research, service, teaching load and tenure and promotion, and, and inconsistency among programs across the country. In ad addition, teacher edu uh, education programs have, have had a long history of an often tenuous relationship with accrediting agencies and state departments of education. That is, in many instances, programs often find themselves in a defensive posture yet continuously in a subordinate role to, quote, please accrediting agencies and state departments of education as opposed to being in a coexisting relationship with them. So these are only a couple of examples with respect to teachers', own, teachers education's own internal struggles. In the end, there exists a juxtaposition between two broad interconnected forces at work impacting teacher education. First, in our work, we are characterizing those as external forces that are led by deep pockets and a neoliberal worldview. Second, there is what we are characterizing as internal forces, whereby teacher education within itself continues to struggle with its identity and power and influence. On one hand, with privatized dollars dangling with set conditions, revenue-strapped teacher education programs often pounce resulting in compromising their own autonomy, expertise, and identity. On the other hand, they internally grapple with issues relative to tenure promotion expectation and the tenuous, tenuous dynamic of dealing with accrediting and State Department agencies. So with the interfacing of these two forces, what we are suggesting in our work here is that we have reached a climax point a turning point in teacher education, whereby we must work prairie in spirit 
to simultaneously denounce those external forces that are laboring to undermine the professionalization of what it takes and means to be a teacher, and also resist those internal forces that look to gently admonish teacher educators themselves who contribute to their own marginalization in thought, practice, and policy and work to announce the furthering of what should be. In other words, the purpose of our work, of our book, is to magnify and to add to the existing sounding bells of resistance when it comes to the external and internal forces that work to undermine teacher education. While we are not claiming to have all the answers, nor are we here with any sort of prescriptions, we do, however, in our work, ask questions, ask the questions, questions that we all need to answer relative to our particular settings and realities. In the final analysis, teacher education must be clear about their identity, their power and influence, mindful of the various forces at work in which to negotiate as we move toward the middle of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about lessons learned in funds of knowledge and immigrant families. So I'm going to uh, make the argument that transnational awareness on the part of children in immigrant families is an important fund of knowledge and that is also the foundation on which some children, some of these immigrant children, are building a cosmopolitan view of the world. So in my work, I follow children, and this is Adam, and we've been working with Adam since he was in first grade, he's now in 10th grade, so every year we've had him draw his own self-portrait. And in a few minutes, I'm going to come back to Adam's story and talk to you about how Adam, a Muslim American immigrant student, is using his knowledge of the world, which he's gained through his immigrant experiences, to um, become a cosmopolitan citizen, a global citizen of our world, and how important that is for us as teachers to recognize and to develop. So transnationalism is the movement of people and media and language and goods between distinct nation states, and it flows in both directions. So this is all the stuff, all the texts, all the literacies that move back and forth between home countries and here in the United States where people have relocated. And we started to realize that the kids had transnational awareness that we didn't realize. Now remember, we're starting with kids who are five, six, seven, eight years old. And these children, we started to realize, knew things about the world. And we didn't see it at first. It wasn't our research question. Our research questions were about literacy and identity development over time and over long periods of time. So we're following these kids from first grade all the way through high school. But when we started looking at what they were doing and what they were saying and listening to their words, we realized they knew things. And these first showed up in their drawings and in the ways they talked about the world. So here's Liz. Liz was six years old, and she's half Korean and half um, American. And she's moved back and forth with her family from Alaska to, to Korea to um, back to the United States. And when we asked her when she was little to draw a picture of her home country, she drew this map. And in the map, she, she draws what you see there with the airplane in the middle, and she starts talking about her map. And she says, this is New York, and that's France, and this is airplane, and this is lots of suitcases, and there's orangey Korea, and right here's Texas, and here's Mexico, here's French, here's New York, there's water. I thought this could be Mexico, and maybe this could be Texas, or maybe this could be Korea, or that can be Korea, and this can be Hawaii, and this can be water. <laughs> so if we had the same reaction you did, we think, oh, this is so sweet. Look at all the, she knows all these countries, and she's drawn them all, and we thought, wow, this is really interesting. There's the suitcases and the airplane, and she knows stuff, right? So then, another um, member of my research team shared with us a picture that James had drawn. Here's James's map. And as he's drawing the map, he's talking aloud. And he's only five years old. And here's what he says. He says, there's something kind of shaped like a triangle, but it looks like this. And he draws a triangle. It's North America. 
And then he points and said, here's land between North America and South America, and then South America, and this is Brazil, and then here's Europe, and here's Asia, and the tiny point down there, which is India. And then he says, long ago, it was connected to North and South America. <laughs> so we realized that James was particularly interested in plate tectonics. <laughs> and was describing this to us. <laughs> so he goes on to say, there were plates, and the plates were like moving apart. And here's the Indian plate, which is around India. It includes the Indian Ocean. And here's part of North America, and then the rest of the land connects to each other. And then he references his family home country saying, wait, remember that land we're talking about? It's right here, China. That's the land there. It's right here. And here's Russia. So this made us think. And we started to see it in other places, the knowledge of the world. Kids were drawing pictures of their home country, and they'd have a thermometer because they were from Mexico, and the thermometer read 100 degrees. And at the time, I was living in Wisconsin. So this was a big deal. The climate differences were, were really important. Then we have people like Adam at age eight, who starts talking about time differences. And he could tell us about the differences not only in what time do you Skype with your father when he's back in Morocco so you can talk to him, and, and what time it is here and what time it is there, but he also talks about the calendar and how they don't have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they have a different calendar, and that the holy days are not relegated to the Julian calendar. Okay. So we started to see all these sorts of things, and we started to realize that these kids do know some, a lot of things. The kids who were growing up in Madison, Wisconsin, and who never left there did not know. So we also started noticing that there were texts that were moving back and forth. So I'm going to talk now about Adam. Because Adam is one of the children who's really making us take this to the next level and to think about this in a little deeper way. So as we think about Adam, his family members were going back and forth between Morocco and the United States. And sometimes they bring books back and forth. And um, they also brought back and forth acts to help Adam memorize the Quran because he, that's what you do in a Muslim family, especially if you're a boy, you memorize the, the Quran passages and then the, the prayers. Um, he was Skyping with relatives, he was reading international newspapers, and he was interacting with people at the mosque. And these were people from all over the world because the Muslim community is not just from the Middle East. The Muslim community comes from across the world. So he was having all these interactions. And we think of all of these as transnational texts that were creating this transnational awareness. So now I want to move on to cosmopolitanism. Okay. Now, there's an old definition of cosmopolitanism, which was, oh, you're a cosmopolitan person if you've been to Paris, right, and you know about the world, and you dress right, and all that. Well, the new stance on cosmopolitanism is that it's a fundamental orientation to the stranger and a welcoming of dis difference. It's the idea that we are not just American, and being American is not the core. We are global citizens, and we're part of a larger community that extends beyond us. And the people in other parts of the world aren't doing things the wrong way or a weird way or an unusual way. That there, it, it, different ways of being are normal and part of, of, of what humanity is. So the transnational awareness of the children in our sample that I'm going to talk about in a minute provides us with hope for creating opportunities that, that identities as cosmopolitan citizens can be realized in practice and as teachers, how we can foster and sustain um, understanding across differences in culture, language, ideology, and geography. And scholars before me have said that teachers need to figure out how to do this. And I'm going to argue something slightly different. Yes, we do. But we also have children in our midst who already know some of this. And they can help us all to learn. Okay. So we're going to move ahead. Adam is now in middle school. And as he entered middle school, we noticed an increasing awareness of political and international issues. They first appeared during the election of Donald Trump, and were later evident in his talk and writing about the war in Syria. We argue that Adam's transnational awareness, the things he was exposed to as a child, have contributed to a deep and noble cosmopolitan stance that we see developing for Adam. When asked about what he thought about living in America back in spring of 2007, Adam responded, pretty scary. And he named Trump as a primary problem, saying he spreads a lot of hate. 
Even before the election, Adam was concerned about Trump's rhetoric. He said, it's already started like people in doing things, burning mosques, spreading hate, eating people up. Adam was pretty sure they wouldn't do most of the things that Trump says he wants to do, like build a wall or take out the Library of Congress. He says, like the Library of Congress belongs to the Congress, they definitely would not vote for the stuff he says. When asked about hate at school, Adam explained, well, there really isn't hate, but people don't understand. Like I'm walking around the hall and I just hear people saying stuff like they don't even know what it means. They're just like yelling like La Hafra. And I'm like, do you even know what that means? And his peers are like, oh, it's something terrorists say. And Adam says, I'm, if, I'm like, that's not what it means at all. It's what we say in prayer, it means God is great. It's not something you say to spread hate or fear, but it's something like praise Jesus Christ. So when I went to see Adam in his eighth grade classroom, probably not surprising to most of you, he was the only student in the class wearing a shirt that said, pray for Syria. And when given a chance to write an argumentative essay, he wrote about the war in Syria. And I asked him, why did you write about Syria? And he says, well, like people, no one talks about it at my school. And I like to bring up the topic to remind people about what's happening in our world. Because some people don't even know there's a civil war happening, like just across the sea. And he says, just like friends I see all the time at the mosque, and they and all their friends, they lived in Syria. And like when the war started, they had to leave, and they were spread across Europe, Lebanon, Turkey, all over. But there's another piece to this theoretical puzzle that I want to add, and that is this idea of critical cosmopolitanism. And critical cosmopolitanism, critical cosmopolitanism says that not only do we, um, not only do we need to understand the world and know about the world, but we also have to be able to um, challenge the world and make the world a better place. So I'm out of time, but I'm going to show you. Oh, I have two minutes? Okay, I'm going to keep talking. Okay, next slide. So Adam was actually organized a fundraiser at the mosque for the children in Syria. And he tells me, you always have to remember, because there are children there that are dying and every day and stuff. And so I think it's an important thing you should know about. He says you should never be too unsocial or not be connected to the world. When my friends tell us stories about his past in Syria, it brings tears to my eyes. He told me ever since the war started, people who don't have homes seek refuge in his old house. And my family's friend, my friend's family allows them. His paper ended with a call to action. The government is very strong, but so are we. You can go places such as mosques and send money, clothes, medication, and food. Check out this website. The people of Syria need to be free. America is a strong, wealthy, and a great nation that is capable of doing anything. So a few conclusions. First, while transnational communication has always been part of the immigrant experiences, new forms of technology have opened up new opportunities for transnational communication, resulting in transnational awareness for children and immigrant families. Second, not only do children and immigrant families know things about people and places around the world, but they may also be developing a transnational sensitivities that recognize different ways of being, acting, and understanding the world. And finally, as educators, we must learn about the transnational funds of knowledge, the transnational awareness of children, and we must honor that knowledge and use it to help all children develop cosmopolitan stances on our world. So as America seems to be moving in a more and more narrow direction, as we talk about building walls and creating um, obstacles to international communication, we need to keep in mind that we are global citizens and this is the world. And I think that the children in our schools can often teach us those lessons. So I leave you with the message um, to, to listen to the children, find out what they know, and seek ways to share that with the other children we work with. Thank you. my privilege to be able to share with you um, on behalf of, I represent a research team, as many of us do, um, several of my colleagues who are here today, Ashley Lewis, Artie Maharaj, Tammy Dickinson, and Karen Utter. We are talking about partnership mapping. This is with uh, Carolina Family Engagement Center, which is a newly funded center. 
And as the title might suggest, we are talking about engaging families in children's education. So a big part of the center's purpose is to coalesce organizations throughout our state involved with family, family engagement, particularly related to K-12 education. So CFEC will serve as the hub for those entities. So um, we have a, a challenge here to measure the establishment and connections among new partnerships and growth and partnerships over time. So as we grappled with this, we really thought, well, how do we do that? How do we really show partnerships? Because we're charged with doing that. And how do we show not just that you have a connection, but what is the nature of that partnership? What is the strength of that partnership? So we explored some tools that were out there and we came across some uh, tools for mapping and Nancy White was one of those persons who had provided some um, opportunities that we took a look at. And we also thought, well, we have partner meetings and we're gonna bring partners together. What are we gonna have them do? <laughs> They don't know each other, some of them do. We don't know who knows each other, who doesn't know each other, so how, what are we gonna do with this? So part of what we wanted to do was be able to provide a way of visually presenting strengths of partnership. So as we will see in a minute, we're gonna actually see some of those maps. So it's important to know that no lines between partners means there is no partnership, not even an awareness. Dashed lines means that there is an awareness only. A uh, single solid line is a limited or a one-time interaction. So this might be where members of different organizations serve on a board together or have some connection, but it's very limited. And then the thicker the solid line is, the stronger the partnership is. So here is um, an example from, not from CFEC, but one that's more limited in, in partners at this time. And this is the College of Education Research Institute. So these are the partners that are represented, the South Carolina Educational Policy Center, the Research Evaluation and Measurement Center, the Child Development Research Center, and then Carolina Family Engagement Center. So as you see here, this was time point one before the existence or the, the development of the Research Institute. Hence, there are no lines to the Research Institute because it didn't exist. But there wasn't, there, it weren't, there was not the case that these organizations didn't or entities didn't have some interaction with each other. So as you can see there, some awareness, some maybe perhaps limited, and some strength in partnership. So then after the Research Institute was put into place, those partnerships strengthened, and there became more than even an awareness of the research institute because there was already an established connection. And here's where we are after the Carolina Family Engagement Center has come into existence. So as you can hopefully see that the, the uh, connection lines, they are strong, they're getting stronger, where there were already established connections, they're strengthening, and where there weren't any connections, then those are taking shape. Now, that's why we presented that slide because uh, it was a little cleaner and easier to see this one. This was actual work from partners in a partnership meeting a couple of weeks ago. And we had small groups of partners with our CFEC, um, our center. And we had listed around in the circle all of the partners who we knew were either part of this or who we thought would be there. And they worked together in small groups and they put what they where they thought their strength of relationships were with these different entities before CFEC came into existence. And it's messy, um, but there are no connections obviously with CFEC. But I think the point here is that as part of what we're commissioned to do is to serve as a hub for organizations and entities that provide um, some form of connection for family engagement and education, we're not starting off with no awareness and no connection. So we're already starting off with some strengths within our state. And then they did another map where they put, now that CFEC has just gotten underway, we're just in our first several months of, of activities with partners, and you can see that there, there are some increases here, and certainly connections with CFEC. As a side note, I will mention that with the three different uh, small groups, 
Not all of the post CFAC maps look the same, which suggests that our partners may not have an awareness of each other. And so it's part of our job to make sure that we're giving back to the partners that information and to help facilitate their connections among each other because there are some strengths and partnerships that are developing and strengthening because of CFAC, but not necessarily through CFAC. So what are our next steps? Well, our next steps here are, um, that was a, those are good visual representations. We're looking into some tools that we can use on our website. Stay tuned, that's to come, hopefully in the next few months. And, but in addition to that, what do we do in terms of our research for quantifying strengths of partnership? So that's where we are now. So we have started looking into trying to take those lines and actually put a rating scale where we have no partnership or not even an awareness would be a zero and then it would grow from there, awareness only. So on a zero to five scale. We don't know how it's gonna go. We're gonna try it out, we're gonna see. We do know that there are some challenges that are associated with this as maybe some of you are already thinking with a critical research lens, okay, but you have all of those partnerships and so are you gonna come up with a total number? Are you gonna come up with an average? What is that even gonna mean? What about as new partners come onto the scene? Now your denominator changes. These are things that we're grappling with. But we do know that uh, we see this as an opportunity for furthering a line of research because many of you are engaged in research that involves partnerships, particularly within education and involving family engagement and schools and communities. And there might be some anecdotal stories that you can share that you say, yeah, this partnership wasn't there before and now because of it, Somebody is better off. Somebody's education has been enhanced. How do you quantify that? How do you visually represent that? We don't know that we're gonna have the answers, but those are the questions that we're dealing with and we're really looking forward to continuing in this work. Thank you so much. physical education and I just really want to thank the uh, Office of Research and Innovation for putting this on today for inviting me to present. I'm really honored to be here so thank you um, and I'm really excited to talk to you all today about really a global body of work that I do that, that surrounds the gross motor development of preschool children with and without disabilities. So raise your hands if you knew that. Today's children are predicted to have a shorter lifespan than their parents for the first time in history. Anybody? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Any idea why? Because we don't really know. <laughs> That's so an idea. Right, I've heard food. It's certainly an option. You know, as long as it's not Diet Coke, I'm all right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm sure we're somewhat familiar with the obesity crisis, right? Well, good news, and we're, you know, surging rates of obesity have occurred, but they bubbled up. So, where is that? And I'm sure some of you are aware that uh, very few of our children actually meet recommendations for daily physical activity. Familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But most people do not realize that we're actually facing a secular decline in gross motor development. Anybody know that? Oh, all right. Well, that's a bad thing. <laughs> All right, so our fundamental motor skills, which are pictured here, well, well, they're the building blocks, right? They're the building blocks to more sports-specific or more advanced movement patterns, and they're really necessary in order to be physically active. All right, so if we are struggling with our motor skills, we're going to have a hard time being physically active. And by the way, I just read a new manuscript about how surging rates of screen time relate with uh, delay in gross motor development, just hot off the press. So, coincidence, maybe, but struggles with uh, motor skills 
Children may not want to be as physically active and it's going to have an effect on their risk for obesity. But some of our newest research is showing that gross motor skills also relate with social emotional skills, executive function, and self-perception, right? So my colleagues and I are working on creating this conceptual model to situate the importance of gross motor development with these other aspects of childhood development. So stay tuned for that. Uh oh, there we go. So for those of you that said you were familiar with the, the secular decline in gross motor development, then you are in the uh, minority, right? So I did a, quite an extensive search and the only references that I could find were situated in very low socioeconomic status settings, right? Where that was considered a risk factor for developmental delay. So my colleagues and I thought, well, we better explore this then, right? So we did some research with around 700 children, right? And we wanted to compare these children with normative, census-based normative data starting back in 1985, and that's the blue, as well as 2000, that's the orange, and then the grays today. And within that, we wanted to explore, okay, how are we doing? Well, you can tell, not so well. But were there any difference based upon gender, social economic status, race, ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera? And the answer is no. And it actually was a shocking finding because the literature would suggest, right? these known barriers. So developmental delay doesn't discriminate. And in our 700 kids, 75% of them scored at the 25th percentile or lower. And we use that 25th percentile to classify children as developmentally delayed and to determine whether or not they should be placed in adaptive physical education. So that was quite alarming for us. So since you're all nice and close to this, um, I took the liberty of breaking down our findings for you based on locomotor skills. You're running, jumping, hopping, skipping types of skills. And so we have the fifth percentile here on the left. No, you can't, you can't see that. So the fifth percentile would be where we'd start to be concerned for something called developmental coordination disorder. Right, that 25th percentile is next, and that's our risk status for developmental delay. 50th, 75th, and 95th. And in 1985, which is the blue line, if you scored a raw score of 26, you were considered developmentally delayed, we put you in adaptive physical education. Today, that would put you in the 75th percentile. Very similar findings for object control skills, which are your throwing, catching, striking, kicking, these sorts of things um, from 2000 and then to today. Well, I don't think I need to convince those of you in this room that we need to intervene and that if we do so, we better do it early. Right, so early intervention is critical. If you wait even as early as fourth grade, it'll be four times harder to remediate these delays than if you tried in preschool, right? So that's really the purpose of my research globally is to examine the effects of integrated motor skill intervention programs on various aspects of children's development. Right, so I have to talk about my community partner. They're, they're phenomenal. I am. Honored, privileged, lucky, thrilled to be the professional development liaison at uh, Lexington 4 Early Childhood Center. Right? And we have the principal, the Montessori coordinator, and the vice principal here, and they're just so excited to be a partner of ours. All right, and Lex 4 is a, a rural school. It has around 650 children, and it's a 100% Title I school. So whether or not you're actually qualified, they treat you as such, and uh, overall the children tend to struggle in the multiple aspects of school readiness. So they have allowed me for the last three years to come on in there and uh, create a muck, I guess, create a ruckus, and implement our motor skill intervention program, which is called SKIP. And we call it SKIP because successful kinesthetic instruction for preschoolers is really hard to say. <laughs> All right, so SKIP is a program that started at Ohio State University, my doctoral advisor, Jackie Goodway, implemented the first SKIP study, and then over the last 20 years or so, we've been evolving this program to fit the needs of today's children. And so the pictures you see here are actually from our current SKIP program over at Lexington 4, and I don't know if you can tell, but there are children with disabilities in the picture. I hope you can't tell. 
Okay, but we try to universally design skip ahead of time so that everyone can participate and that their learning is maximized. So skip works. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> All right, I apologize, my uh, picture's got a little wonky for you here from the map transition, but uh, so this was the first skip study, and this study was conducted in Flint, Michigan. Know anything about Flint? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, in this study, uh, this was my advisor's dissertation, it's kind of cool to show it to you. She had about 200 children, four year olds mostly, about 95% African American, and their motor skill test scores at the pre test were right around the 14th percentile. That's not good. And in just as little as 10 weeks, just twice a week, 30 minutes at a time, those kids went from, you can't see, the 14th percentile to above the 70th. Right, just a little bit of physical education in preschool, right? <laughs> but the control kids, they flat on right? And the control kids receive their center's everyday curriculum, which is daily recess. So my doctoral student, Sally Taunton, some of you know, she wanted to take skip and see, well, are there any differential effects for kids with and without disabilities since we claim it to be universally designed? And well, that red line there represents the 25th percentile. And again, the majority of the kids fell far below it at the pretest. The top group would be our experimental group without disabilities. The middle group would be our experimental group with disabilities. And then the flatliners, of course, are our control kiddos. This study was nine weeks, same thing, twice a week, 30 minutes. And you know, although our kiddos with disability didn't quite see the same amount of achievement, they averaged around the 50th percentile, which is pretty good. This was my dissertation, right? And so I really wanted to make sure SKIP was ecologically valid. Less than 1% of early childhood centers have a physical education teacher. And so I went in and worked with Head Start teachers, and it worked. Yay. <laughs> Works with parents, too, because they're kind of important. They're the ones that say, yeah, you can play, or no, you can't. Right? Works with parents. Yippee. <laughs> Recently, our colleagues have taken Skip and flipped the classroom. Right? They, they trained, not to train's a bad word, they helped coach parents, brought them into parent meetings, and gave them Skip content, sent them home, to see if they would do Skip. And they loved it. It didn't work. So interestingly, unintentionally, other aspects of child development have come along for the ride. So not only did we significantly improve their gross motor development, but we've improved their social emotional development, social cognitive, executive functioning, temperament, prosocial behavior, gender stereotyping, on and on and so forth. All these things are coming along. And I think I'm almost out of time, but I do quite a bit of work with children with visual impairments as well. I had a brandscape with them and it worked too. Okay. <laughs> so, what's next? We're going to bring the study that we did in Wales here to Lexington 4. Stay tuned for that. All right, we're also going to see do the effects of skip sustain longitudinally? We'd like to scale it up. And then eventually, I want to change that policy to require physical education in preschool. No time for questions, but thank you. <laughs> right here to wrap it up for us today. I really want to thank all of our speakers for today. Um, they have been fabulous. Um, thank you. I've learned so much. Hopefully you have too. You all have been a wonderful audience. So thank you for coming and thank you for joining us if you were watching the live stream. And thank you to all of the support personnel who make this possible. Um, as we mentioned in the beginning, a huge thank you to the support of Dean Peterson, the Office of Research and Innovation, and um, all of us who are, uh, all of you who are part of our college. Thank you so much. Please join us for the reception and for some conversation.